Uh, hello, I am Andrew Hipsley. I am the Dean of the Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Thank you for joining us for the second part of our series, Perspectives on the Pandemic. This is where we invite experts to share their expertise to help us make sense of a world that has been upended. As we strive to live through the pandemic, we experience a sense of loss, loss of lives and livelihoods, but also loss connected to our very humanity as social creatures. And it is the social and human perspectives on the pandemic that we wish to foreground in part two of our series. And it is the experts we look to shed light, their light on these confusing times. Perspectives on the pandemic pulls these experts to center stage to help us make sense of what we feel is under threat. The role of the city in the life of a community. The responsibility that a civilized society has to its vulnerable populations, including those in prison. The importance of the arts in the communication between performer and audience. And democracy itself. We begin with this last, the impact of COVID-19 on democracy in the world. I would like to call on Dr. Neil Allen, Chair of the Department of Political Science, to introduce us to today's speaker. Over to you, Neil. Thank you, Dean Hipsley, for um, those remarks and for this particular um, lecture series. I'm honored to introduce my colleague, Denora Asperu, who is a professor of political science here in the Department of Political Science. Her expertise is of global politics, and in particular, the politics of democratization and authoritarianism. She has written widely on issues of public opinion, particularly from Latin America, and in recent years has been working on issues of authoritarianism. She recently has published on this, this particular topic in both scholarly and popular uh, outlets, including recently in the Spanish newspaper and website El País, which also widely circulates in, uh, across Latin America. And we are very um, fortunate to have Professor Osper in our department at this particular time uh, to give a comparative talk on democracy and the threats to it in, the in a time of crisis. Thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll take over. Thank you, um, Dean Hipsley and Cheryl for organizing this important series and especially for inviting me. And also thank you to uh, Neil for, for introducing me. Um, and I'm representing the Department of Political Science and I'm very happy to share some of the perspectives on the issues that we deal with, uh, which are probably not um, what we see every day in the news about the pandemic. I will use a PowerPoint and share my screen my presentation goes as follows. I will uh, first uh, talk something that maybe goes a little bit differently from the, from the title of the presentation, uh, which is differences between political system and the outcome of the pandemic. So I'll use the outcome of the pandemic and how, as, uh, as my dependent variable, and how different political systems um, have responded and have fared in different ways uh, with regards to, to the outcome of the pandemic. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about political structures, whether they made a difference and whether political culture made a, played a role. Then I'll go into the main part of the presentation, which is uh, the different types of regimes that exist around the world and the impact of uh, COVID-19 uh, on those, uh, on democracy in the world. Uh, I, because I know we, all of those uh, who are here in this uh, presentation of the audience is not, uh, Political science, a political science audience, I will spend a little bit of time just defining some of the terminology that we use mostly in comparative politics, uh, because that those definitions are very important with regards to, to the content of my talk, and that's why uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, then I'll talk about a couple of um, indexes, and one, one index and one institution that are actually tracking the impact of the pandemic on democracy. 
and I'll show their websites uh, and, uh, and then I'll conclude on what has been the impact. And finally, I'll uh, talk a little bit about the challenges for democracy in the post-pandemic world, both from the perspective of uh, what governments uh, challenges are and also citizens and, and civil society. Uh, first, the differences between political system and the outcome of the pandemic. So as I mentioned before, and I, I use this uh, diagram a lot to, you know, especially for students when I used to teach uh, research methods. Uh, we're trying to explain in this case the dependent variable, which is the pandemic, the public health outcomes. And uh, we have a lot of independent variables that have been uh, dealt with or mentioned in the press and in different outlets. Um, whether the level of urbanization, the age pyramid had a, an impact in Europe, the population is older, inequality had a huge impact in Latin America, access to healthcare, and the extent of the restrictions. But I'm not going to go into those because those are, and I think uh, Chase will probably talk about urbanization next week. I'm going to talk about the political variables that may have influenced uh, the, the outcome of the pandemic, uh, meaning whether you know there were more deaths and cases or not in some countries or in some systems than in others. And there are some particular variables that I want to talk about, the state capacity, the type of institutions, and political structures and political culture. Uh, just to very quickly, uh, this is a chart that I usually show in my classes of comparative politics of all the different things that you can find in regimes or in, in uh, countries around the world. You can find countries by regime type that are democratic in between or authoritarian, and that's really the main uh, part of my talk today. But we also find different economic systems from capitalists to communists. We find republics, uh, including the Republic of North Korea. Sometimes we get mixed up. Uh, students are surprised that there are republics that are not democratic, but yes, indeed there are. Uh, and then, or monarchies, whether this is important, where parliamentary systems are different, you know, in regards to the pandemic from presidential, whether legislatures that are on like camera had a different impact from those that are bicameral. Uh, this is also important where federal governments that have decentralized decision making uh, had a harder time than unitary governments that have centralized government. Uh, code law versus civil law, proportional representation versus majoritarian systems, a number of parties or democratic or authoritarian political culture. But like I said, my focus today is going to be on regime time. Um, the Really, because it, everything is so recent, and I suppose this happens in all the disciplines, journal articles haven't really been uh, written, you know, especially quantitative journal articles that actually test these things. Uh, the American Political Science Association meeting is going to be held at the beginning of September, virtually, we assume. And I think that in that uh, meeting, a lot of studies are going to be, you know, actually testing these issues of, you know, what kind of regimes, etc., have more... Uh, or impact on, on the outcome of the pandemic. But for now, we have to rely on things that have been written by, by scholars, maybe in short articles, public scholarship and other things. Two of the major things that were written, one of them tested it empirically was Sophia Fenner, who published this, uh, you know, and concluded that state capacity matters. And we're gonna talk a little bit with what a state capacity is. And Francis Fukuyama, who you probably have heard before, even if you're not political scientist, he concluded that countries that are that have a competent state apparatus, a government that citizens trust and listen to, and effective leaders have performed impressively, limiting the damage that they have suffered. Now, again, this hasn't been totally uh, tested empirically, but uh, these are good scholars that looked at the things that are happening around the world and concluded that uh, that this is important. Um, when we talk about the state capacity in political science, we, we use, at least I use a lot of indicators that have been created by different organizations. And uh, we can classify states around the world by strong, weak, or failed states. And in blue are the stronger states, in green are the states that are strong but have some uh, flaws, yellow the states that are weak but not totally failed. And then in pink and red, we have the states that are failed. Uh, by failed state, we mean a uh, state that cannot deliver basic goods and services and cannot fulfill the basic uh, role of a uh, state, which is uh, providing security to citizens. So uh, in a nutshell, you know, the, the scholars and most people have concluded that state capacity you know, and how strong a state is. And that doesn't mean that a state has to intervene a lot. It doesn't mean that a state has to have a lot of money. It means that a state is efficient, you know, and that varies as we know from country to country. 
even from a state to state within the US, uh, regardless of, of the ideology of the, or the level of intervention of the government in the economy. Uh, the other thing that uh, Fukuyama and you know, Fennel, Fennel and other scholars have mentioned repeatedly is that political trust matters. And this is, you know, I do political culture studies, so I'm particularly interested in this uh, variable which is uh, political trust, the trust that people have in institutions. We usually measure this in surveys through a question that asks people, uh, you know, do you trust the government? Do you trust, you know, the, uh, the Congress and other institutions? So it is, uh, it can be, you know, different things, uh, or measure different institutions. But in general terms, uh, what we saw in this, uh, and of course, surveys are difficult to carry out right now, especially in developing countries, because many people don't have access to phones. So you have to go door to door, but that is not possible these days. So a lot of uh, the, the samples that are being, you know, uh, uh, that are being surveyed are uh, people that do have phone lines, you know, including this one. But what we see in this Edelman uh, trust barometer is that from January of 2020 to, uh, to May of 2020, there was an 11 point increase in trust in government. So at least up to May, the pandemic seems to have had a good impact, you know, a positive impact on trust in government, now, or trust in, uh, uh, in the government of 11 countries. So that, one thing is that it was only in 11 countries and it was a sample of people who are informed people, as they call it here, this is people that have an education and they have access to, to phones and other things. Now, uh, I just wanted to show this graph because it, it is very important uh, in the case of the US to see how trust and probably I know sociologists use uh, this also a lot. So you can see how trust has declined over the year from um, 1960 in the US trust in government has been declining, you know, uh, to a point in which in 2015 it was already very low. So that was way before the the election and that happened in 2016 and everything, there's been an issue with American politics of uh, lack of, uh, of losing trust in, in government, which is uh, something that is uh, really worrisome. Um, so beyond political, you know, a state capacity and uh, political trust in government or political trust as we call it, uh, what, you know, there is still a question out there as to what other predictor variables of political nature have influenced the pandemic. And again, like I said, uh, there is uh, an issue of, uh, of a journal that has called for papers specifically on the pandemic in political science. So we'll probably learn more soon. But uh, things that we still want to learn and we don't know for sure is whether federal systems are uh, less efficient than unitary systems. Unitary systems, for instance, the United Kingdom, so this doesn't have to do anything with democracy. Uh, we know that there are several unitary countries in the world that have democratic regimes, but they have centralized decision making. They don't have to go to each state and let, you know, like federal governments. Uh, so is that, does that make a difference? The other big issue that might make a difference is whether there is parliamentary versus, or a presidential system, and that I'm sure someone is going to be testing that in the near future because uh, the role of leadership is different. We know that in a, in a presidential system, the figure of the president, who is both head of state and head of government, is much more important and much more visible than the role of a prime minister in a parliamentary system where um, you know, he, he works through, through to parliament a lot. Uh, we also know that the role of political parties and processes is different in both systems to a certain extent. And the achievement of consensus is uh, somewhat easier in parliamentary systems, especially in uh, where you have coalitions of uh, different parties. In the US, of course, having a two party system, which is one, one of the few democracies, uh, advanced democracies that only have two parties, uh, things might get even more complicated. Uh, in the next section, I'll, you know, I'll talk about democratic versus authoritarian regimes. What I like is quote uh, from one of someone in the Atlantic, which I read often, which is just as individuals with pre-existing conditions are more vulnerable to the virus, so too, it would seem our countries with underlying instability. So countries that had problems to begin with, you know, they seem to have had uh, a harder time uh, with the impact of the pandemic. Now uh, we look at regime types more specifically on the impact of COVID-19. Uh, so the question is different is in terms of the pandemic, health outcomes, has regime type made a difference? Um, now, democracy and why democracy, and I always, you know, I give a lot of talks about democracy uh, when I do survey research, 
And we always emphasize, you know, Winston Churchill's uh, famous quote, and I will read the whole thing, but uh, he said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. So we humans haven't invented anything better than democracy. But democracy is not as simple as it sounds, right? Uh, and uh, a broad, you know, uh, classification that is often used, although not all political scientists agree with all classifications, but what we use is that there are democracies and there are authoritarian regimes. And within democracies, you can find liberal democratic regimes and electoral democratic regimes, and Alex, these are also called hybrids sometimes. And within authoritarian regimes, there are electoral authoritarian regimes, but there are fully authoritarian regimes. So very, uh, and I, again, you know, going back to the indicators and the maps, which I love because they are very telling. Uh, we have, for instance, Freedom House, which is a proxy for democracy. And in green, we see all the countries that are considered free or, you know, that are considered full democracies. In yellow, we have partially free countries, which could be called, you know, electoral democracies, most of them. And in purple, we have countries that are considered authoritarian, either electoral authoritarian countries like uh, Russia or fully authoritarian countries like, uh, like China. Um, liberal democratic regimes would be like the highest standard of, them, of democracy. And it's what uh, we aspire to have, or what we have in the US and in the West, you know, in Western European countries. Uh, the minimalist definition by Robert Dole, our uh, famous uh, political scientist, is that uh, government decisions are, vec are uh, vested in elected officials that are frequently unfair elections. There is the right to vote for all adults, practically. Uh, all adults have the right to run for office. There is freedom of expression and association. Uh, there is freedom of information, which is very important. People, you know, political scientists uh, have added to that definition, there's gotta be accountability between, uh, between uh, branches of government, between vertical, between citizens and, and people who govern. Uh, this is very important because it differentiates a democracy really from an authoritarian regime. There's gotta be uncertainty about electoral outcomes. The winner is not predetermined. Of course, there are polls and the polls are gonna tell you, oh, this person has the lead in the polls, you know, so that, that doesn't mean that there is uncertainty. We know to a certain extent that someone has the lead, but we don't know for sure. Like in many authoritarian countries, we know who is going to be uh, the next president regardless of what happens. There's gotta be representation, political representation, a strong, a strong rule of law and political equality. Even if uh, some people have more resources, the idea is that everyone has to have the right to to vote, one vote, one, you know, one person, one vote. Uh, electoral democratic regimes, which would be also, you know, mid-range democracies or illiberal democracies are still considered democratic regimes. They pass the meaningful threshold of democracy. They have uh, free and fair elections, but they fall short of a strong respect for political and civil liberties. Uh, they have weak political institutions, weak civil societies, and most developing countries that uh, are part of what we call the third wave of democracy, I won't explain that right now, but uh, they have this type of, uh, let's say, democracy that is still in the, you know, working to become hopefully one day full democracy or liberal democracy. Now, with electoral authoritarian regimes, that is a little more complicated. They are also called competitive authoritarian regimes. And I want to mention this because, uh, one of the major impacts of COVID-19 has been actually on electoral authoritarian regimes. And they do have formal institutions. In fact, uh, political scientists have found that 80% of the countries in the world now have elections, but that doesn't mean that they are all uh, democratic. Um, they have institutions, but there is, and this is very important, an uneven playing field between government and the opposition. So the opposition might get some representation in the legislature, but it never wins major offices, just because of the way the system is set up. And elections are held regularly, but they are, and they are free of massive fraud, but there is abuse of state resources. They deny the opposition and the uh, media cover, coverage. There is harassment of uh, opposition candidates, a manipulation of electoral laws, uh, manipulation or licenses revoked for the media, members of the opposition may be persecuted. So there is a lot of things that even if there are elections, you know, those elections certainly are not uh, fair and the, elect the electoral outcome is not unknown. It's not uncertain. Everybody knows that the party in government is going to win again. Now, authoritarian regimes, also called autocracies or dictatorships, they also have elections, some of them, 
there's this like everybody seems to like elections, but they disregard competitive elections. They tend to have uh, one party systems like the case of China, where only the communist party exists. And we must remember that Saddam Hussein, you know, in Iraq had elections, Anastasio Somoza in Nicaragua had elections and they always won with 90% of the vote or 95%. And Lukashenko in Belarus, which we'll talk about later, you know, just had elections in, in uh, Bel Belarus in August, on August 8th. And he again won, you know, he's been in power for 26 years. So it is considered an authoritarian regime. There were really no opposition candidates. Uh, authoritarian regimes disregard freedoms, uh, limited political rights, if any, no room for opposition, widespread use of repression or human rights violations, no independent judiciary. Uh, it's important to see who is in charge, whether it is, you know, a strong man or a political party alone, like in the case of China and Cuba, the army, the royal family, and also important to understand whether they are on the right, because there are authoritarian regimes that are on the right that support free market economies, and some that support uh, the left. So that being said, and I'm sorry for all these theoretical things, I'll, I'll show that later. Uh, did regime type make a difference in the outcome of the pandemic? Fukuyama and Fenner say that regime type has not made a difference, uh, and they point out that some democracies were also successful in, in reducing the impact of the, of the pandemic, uh, like South Korea. Uh, however, uh, you know, papers that I've read at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace at the Brookings Institution, experts there, they say that it is too early to tell. And it is important, like the Brookings uh, report said, that uh, this pandemic has opened uh, this debate that is one of the most uh, vital debates of the post-Cold War era, that uh, whether democracy or authoritarianism is best suited to deal with uh, the unprecedented threats, in this case, the threat of the pandemic. If we look at the numbers, overall authoritarian regimes, both electoral authoritarian and fully authoritarian, reported lower per capita numbers of cases and deaths than uh, democratic countries. But of course, the question is, is can we trust the data? You know, um, the case of Venezuela, Nicaragua, and the case of Latin America, which I know well, they have the lowest rates almost of infection, you know, together with the democratic country of Uruguay and Costa Rica. But uh, like everybody says, who would believe President Maduro in Venezuela that he's reporting the right numbers, right? There is no independent media, limited access uh, of outside actors. Uh, one thing that is interesting, and I will, I'll come back to this at the end, is what uh, we call in political science authoritarian advantage. You know, and it's authoritarian regimes to make decisions, they don't have to go to public debate. You know, they, they can make decisions without debating it in public. Policy decisions reflect what the ruling class wants. You know, uh, there's no negotiations with other groups. There is no need for checks and balances of how the money is being spent or other things. So, uh, and public information is of low quality or very limited to the government perspective. So that makes it easier if you want for authoritarian countries to, to, to do things in certain ways. The other thing that is worrisome in, and it, that this pandemic has shown it is also uh, what we call the Chinese model uh, in political science, where uh, it is going to be appealing to fragile democracies. China has been making huge inroads into the developing world. Uh, Latin America included, but also in Africa and in other parts of the world. Uh, you probably heard of the project called Belt and Road you know, program. And with trade, you know, it's one of the main trade partners of Latin American countries nowadays, uh, when the US always used to be in the past, but uh, China has surpassed uh, the US, even if like some um, politicians in the US in the past used to call Latin America our backyard. So even in, in our backyard, you know, uh, China is now the main uh, trade partner. Uh, so uh, many people, uh, question will the political model of China be tempting, especially after supposedly they had success with uh, leading with this pandemic. So that, that is something to watch. Now we'll talk more specifically about the impact of the pandemic on democracy. And now the COVID-19 pandemic is going to be the independent variable and the outcome, I mean, I mean the dependent variable is going to be democracy. So just uh, going back to, to my chart, so just to remind you, so in terms of respect and human rights and democratic liberties, has regime type matter? And uh, that's what we're going to try to answer. There are some important caveats that I want to uh, mention because we cannot understand the impact of the pandemic without understanding what was going on in the world before the pandemic. And uh, one important thing is that democratic, what we call democratic backsliding in comparative politics, which is autocratization or democratic erosion, was already occurring in the world. Uh, Freedom House, which I showed you before, has been reporting declines in, uh, 
in the quality and the support and uh, democracy in general indicators for the past 14 years, but it's been particularly bad in the past five years. Uh, what does it mean backsliding? Well, it means that uh, previously democratic regimes have turned into electoral authoritarian regimes, like the case of Hungary, that electoral authoritarian regimes have turned into fully autocratic regimes, like the case of Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Turkey, that uh, authoritarian regimes themselves have been uh, tightened in the grip, uh, and electoral authoritarian also like, like, like Russia, and fully authoritarian like China, uh, that there are growing constraints on democracy in some countries that are still considered democracies like India. Uh, there is the rise of populism, both right-wing populism in the, especially in, in, in the West, uh, in advanced democracies, but also uh, left-wing populism in other parts of the world uh, and right-wing populism. And overall, like I was mentioning, the decline of trust in democracy and in political institutions is happening all over, not only in the United States. The second caveat is that uh, COVID-19 allowed governments around the world to legally enforce restrictions to contain the pandemic. So it wasn't like all of a sudden they're going to be doing something illegal. Constitutions in most countries allow for the implementation of restrictions with variations from country to country. But the problem is when those uh, restrictions uh, go beyond what is established in the constitution or go on for too long as we're going to see. One thing that is important is that the postponement of elections per se was not seen as a violation because it was necessary in many cases. Um, the third thing, and this is very methodological because I'm going to show you some indicators, uh, the measurement of political impact of the pandemic is more difficult and diffuse than the measurement, for instance, of the health impact or the economic impact. Uh, it's more difficult to, to put a number on this. However, two institutions, uh, the Democracy Project uh, and also the International IDEA have been actually tracking the impact of the, of, uh, the pandemic on democracy. Freedom House has been mostly doing general monitoring without coming with a specific uh, numbers. Uh, the sources for these assessments that I'm going to show you are going to be expert opinions, media, and documents that feed into these uh, institutions uh, that have been doing a great job trying to capture that impact of the pandemic. So we see uh, the pandemic violations index, which is uh, was constructed or built by the V Democracy Institute. Uh, and you see uh, that in green, there are countries where that had no violations. In lighter green, minor violations. In uh, orange, you want to call it, uh, there's some violations. Uh, major violations didn't occur, didn't occur in all countries of the world, but they did occur, and I'll show you specifically which countries uh, in the world uh, had uh, major violations. Now, let me just enlarge this a little bit. What elements did they take into account to, to come up with this index? Well, that uh, no time limit, so when some uh, restrictions were put in place, uh, maybe they were made permanent, you know, by decree or by approval of the legislature, you know, or, pre or presidential decree. Uh, the restrictions that were imposed on the pandemic actually became permanent restrictions. Uh, there were also discriminatory, discriminatory measures against certain groups within uh, society. Uh, there, were, there was a derogation of rights that according to international law cannot be derogated. Uh, this was one of the major issues, you know, restrictions of media freedom in several countries, limitation on the legislature, um, arbitrary or abusive enforcement of, of the measures, and government disinformation campaign. Uh, so those, let me go back. To that. Those are some of the issues that they took into account. Oh, no, I gotta lower this just. Okay, so what countries had major violations of, uh, during the pandemic? Uh, liberal democracies, none of the countries that are liberal democracies, including the US, had major violations. Among the electoral democracies, and why, that's why I wanted to make the difference at the beginning of the different types of regimes. Uh, the, there was India, which is free by Freedom House standards, you know, had major violations. El Salvador, which all of these are partially free, which they are uh, electoral uh, democracies. El Salvador had, uh, the Philippines had some major violations. Serbia did, Hungary did, and Haiti did. Uh, and among authoritarian regimes, 
of electoral authoritarian regimes with major violations. We find uh, all of them in Africa, Uganda, Zambia, and Ethiopia. And among authoritarian regimes that already had a lot of violations because they are authoritarian, had even further violations. Uh, we're talking about uh, Saudi Arabia, which as you see in the scale of from zero to 100 that Freedom House uses, 100 being fully democratic, like you know, Norway gets 100 points. Uh, Saudi Arabia only gets seven points, so that's how autocratic it is. But Saudi Arabia even managed to have even further, uh, you know, restrictions during the pandemic. Oman did too. Uh, Eritrea in Africa, the Democratic Republic of Congo, also China also had some major violations. Egypt and Somalia. So not all countries in the world had major violations, but uh, some countries did. And uh, this is an example that I, well, let me see if I can do this. I'm checking my time. I wanted to show you this map because I think it's important. So let me for a minute stop share and then I'll come back to sharing. I just, I found out testing this yesterday that, uh, that for some reason Zoom doesn't let you open several windows at a time. Uh, doesn't let you. So let me see if this works. If not, I'll can try to do it at the end. But so it's not opening. That's fine. I'll just do it at the end. I'll go back to sharing my my PowerPoints. Okay, I'll get back to that one in the end. So um, in the end, uh, okay, so there were some countries that were major violators and some were not. This is the second uh, monitor of COVID-19 impact on democracy and human rights. And it was, it is more careful even and more detailed than the previous uh, one by, by V Democracy and it's called, uh, you know, the global monitor. And you see a map here, I'll try to enlarge this so you can see it better. Uh, you see that uh, countries that have concerning developments are most countries in the world, according to them. You know, from Russia to China to the U.S. to Mexico, many South American countries and, and other countries, they had uh, concerning developments. And some countries only had uh, development, developments uh, that have to be watched, you know, like Canada and a few countries. But you see that the red points are all over, or the red, you know, uh, Dots are all over the place, meaning that many countries had uh, some concerning developments with regards to, to, to the impact of, uh, of democracy. This is an example of uh, something that, smaller, and I won't read all this text, I just wanted to show you uh, what International IDEA makes, you know, the, the, the monitoring they do. Uh, and these are electoral democracies. This is a case of Hungary, they put a regime type, and they uh, tell us whether there was a state of emergency or not in the country, when it was implemented, and what type of, uh, of powers it gave to the executive. The problem in Hungary, for instance, is that it gave sweeping powers to the executive without a set limit. After that, the legislature you know, put uh, powers, uh, they, pre put, you know, they went back on this, but they preserved the possibility of Prime Minister Orban to rule by decree when necessary, which is seen as a major violation of democracy in the world. So this is one of the most concerning cases, uh, and it's right there in Europe. And uh, also they track uh, whether there was, uh, uh, they put a summary of the type of uh, impact on, on democracy and human rights. And in the case of Hungary, uh, there was, uh, you know, there's concern about the freedom of expression and media integrity, and um, provisions along these purported, these proportionate measures to curb disinformation, including up to five years in prison. So uh, this was, this is one of the most concerning democracies in the world now. The case of Hungary, El Salvador, which had been, you know, an electoral democracy that was functioning okay for a long time, as a new president that communicates everything through Twitter. And they also enacted a state of emergency. And uh, under his administration, he actually took office uh, last year, so he hasn't been in power too long. Uh, they implemented the most stringent restrictions on personal freedoms to fight COVID-19 in the Americas. And, uh, and they have had uh, clashes with the different you know, branches of government and also with uh, the private sector and, and with uni leaders and other things. 
the sad thing, if you want to say it, and also for the, the rest maybe of other democracies, is that as of late July, President Bukele of El Salvador had the highest approval rating of any president uh, of the Americas. Over 80% of Salvadorians said that they approve of the president handling of the pandemic and of the job he's doing in general. So uh, those of us who do political culture studies worry, okay, so when presidents violent human rights, you know, and they uh, do these very things that go against democracy and people support them uh, with very high marks, uh, that means that maybe there is something wrong with political culture. Now, it has to be taken into account that El Salvador has been uh, suffering from a problem of gang violence for many years. And so he has been cracking down on gangs and this, especially during the pandemic, and this has, seen as, has been seen as something positive. Uh, two countries, so these two countries are electoral democracies, but they do, they did suffer uh, under the pandemic. Now, countries that were already authoritarian, one of them electoral authoritarian like Russia. Why is Russia an electoral authoritarian regime and not a fully authoritarian regime? Well, because Putin still has elections. Uh, of course, we know what happened to one of the opposition leaders recently. Everybody probably heard about the, the poisoning, though the government denies it. Uh, but we know that Putin always, you know, is going to win the elections, right? There's really no question about the, the outcome of the election. But they do have multi parties and they do have multiple elections. And China is a fully authoritarian regime because they have one single party and allow no opposition. In both cases, uh, you know, China and Russia, there was no state of emergency. But uh, why it is not maybe required as much as in a democracy because a lot of the rights were already constrained by the fact that they are um, authoritarian regimes. Um, what uh, IDEA says is that civic and media space is already restrained and power is concentrated in the president in Russia. So that's why, and, but there is still the worry that further clamp down or the freedom of speech is going to occur during the pandemic. And in the case of uh, the People's Republic of China, there is also concerns that the government is using the, the concept of the pandemic to tighten control over Hong Kong. And we're going to talk uh, you know, about Hong Kong and the, and the new security law in, uh, in China in a little bit. Uh, so as we see, and I'll, I'll try to show you the, the link, uh, the website afterwards, uh, there was an impact on the pandemic. Now, um, I wanted to talk briefly about some specific effects on democracy. Elections, IDEA has a different system of tracking, not the tracking of impact on democracy, but election, uh, impact on this elections. And as of uh, August 23rd, you know, starting in February, at least 70 countries and territories across the globe have decided to postpone elections. 55 have decided to hold national elections, despite concerns about the pandemic. And 20 countries have held elections that were initially postponed. One of the most recent cases of postponement was uh, New Zealand, which just last week, as you can see in this news clip from August 8, 17 here, they postponed the elections because of an outbreak. And of course, that depends on every country and every constitution, whether the constitution allows for this postponement or not. Uh, the other big impact uh, of the pandemic, a specific issue is the protests. For several months, uh, protests were put on hold by the pandemic. Uh, Latin America was undergoing a, you know, a lot of, of protests, but it just came to a halt. And a lot of countries around the world were undergoing uh, you know, protests. Uh, but the most surprising, it kind of came back in the past three weeks, uh, the most surprising case, I would say, is Belarus. Uh, and the protests there are directly related to the issues of elections and democracy. Uh, they are a consequence of the rigged elections. Uh, on August 9, that Lukashenko, you know, the dictator, won after one again. That's why I put one in, in quotation marks. The other place where protest has not occurred uh, because precisely this new uh, China security, new security law came into effect on June 30th. Uh, so it has so many uh, worrisome features that uh, even students who are taking online classes, uh, say at Wichita State or somewhere else, and uh, they, you know, read a criticism of China can be put in jail. So if I spread the universities in the East Coast that have a lot of uh, people taking uh, classes in Hong Kong and in other places are really worried. And some professors have decided to put in their syllabus at the beginning a warning saying in this class you might you know, uh, uh, hear criticism of China. Um, and in some cases, they actually let the students submit issues, uh, submit papers with a fake name or with a different ID name so that the government won't track it. So it's a very, very, very uh, 
serious thing. I teach comparative politics and we do talk about China and all the lack of democracy. So I asked and uh, we don't have, I don't have any students that are taking classes from Hong Kong, fortunately. The other place uh, is Bolivia, where supporters of former President Morales uh, posted in August, uh, you know, they protested against the third delay of presidential elections, but the spread of COVID is still serious in, um, in Bolivia. So I think it was a good idea to postpone it, even if some people didn't want to postpone it. The last specific, specific effect uh, is corruption, unfortunately. Uh, third wave democracies, which are again developing democracies, have been hit by corruption and scandals into the pandemic. South Africa, allegations of corruption limited to billions in corona, coronavirus relief. Latin America, the spread of coronavirus fuels corruption. Uh, things as sad as, uh, you know, body bags that were of bad quality and that would open in the middle of, you know, when people were trying to put people in places, uh, overpricing. There's just so many things that have happened in Latin America that I follow that is really sad to see that, uh, that even during an emergency, corruption has emerged as one of the cancers of democracy. Uh, and even in, um, in Canada, you probably heard that President Trudeau uh, suspended parliament. And of course, the opposition was decrying uh, that this was a cover up for some uh, things he was being accused of. And the King of Spain uh, also had to leave the country uh, because of accusing, I mean, it's the former king, he had already uh, abdicated uh, because of the of corruption allegations. So uh, these are some of the major things. Uh, and very quickly, because I'm running out of time, I'm going to talk about some challenges for democracy in the post-pandemic world. So we don't know when we're going to be in the post-pandemic world. You know, hopefully when the vaccine comes up and all the other scientists will know better than I do when that will be. But let's be hopeful and hope that there is going to be a post-pandemic world someday. So uh, what is going to be the impact on government and political actors? So what is going to be the, the future? You know, what's, what's the, the prospect? What is the prospect? In general, we have to wonder what will be the effect on the pandemic on the role of the state in the economy. Uh, I read, a, you know, I heard actually a talk by Stephen Levitsky at Harvard, which is one of the most uh, renowned uh, academics working on democracy. He thought that maybe uh, the pandemic has demonstrated the need for the state, right? These people that say, oh, the state is not necessary. The private sector can do everything. Uh, maybe not. You know, there are things that uh, this pandemic, the government needed to do that couldn't be done by, by, the, by the private sector. So he was saying, you know, he was wondering, is this the end of the neoliberal state? So we, that's something we don't know. Uh, how people are going to feel about the role of the state for those of us who, uh, who study public opinion is also going to be important. You know, are they going to trust the state more, but also are they going to believe that it has to be more uh, regulated, re regulated and have a, a larger role? Uh, populism, which is uh, something that I follow very closely, uh, we don't know whether it will strengthen or weaken. Uh, we know that populism divides, you know, populism, a populist leader is the one that tells you that the elites are to blame for everything that is happening, that, that uh, the people are the only ones that are good. Uh, both on the left or on the right, they say the same thing as uh, the common characteristic. So we don't know whether divisive populist leaders will prevail in the post-pandemic world or whether unifying leaders that try to bring people together will, will uh, prevail. Uh, one big question for those of us interested in regime change is whether regime change will happen. Uh, we know that on August 18, for the first time in many years, there was a coup d'etat in Africa. Uh, in Mali, and it's very uncommon uh, to have this, you know, in the in the 21st century. Uh, will the democratic uh, model have the upper hand? And that's the big question I I, I have, you know, and uh, what I talk about uh, before the authoritarian advantage. But hopefully, you know, I hope the democratic model will prevail. Uh, Finally, almost finally, in countries that are democratic, uh, you know, we all have to do something with politics, even if we don't study politics, you all vote, hopefully. Uh, we don't know if business as usual will be the word for politics in the future or whether there will be changes, whether political parties will become less polarized, which has been one of the most worrisome signs of politics in recent times, not only in the US, polarization seems to be everywhere, believe me. Uh, who will, you know, what will be the national agenda? And who will set the agenda? That is something that we political scientists always ask. Will the decision-making policy experience a change? Will there be more accountability? That's something that we don't know. Uh, will the influence of other actors uh, be different to now? The military, and I found this quote from the Carnegie Endowment, which is interesting. Uh, crisis responses may shift 
the balance of power between militaries and civilian authorities. And, and that again, I'm talking about the world in general. What will be the role of interest groups and also extra legal groups like terrorist groups and human trafficking and drug trafficking, which we know all have been affected by the pandemic in different ways. Uh, and one of the biggest questions for us as political scientists is how will elections look in a post-pandemic world? We already know even in the US with the conventions of both parties, because parties going on now uh, virtually, you know, that things have profoundly changed. So one of the questions I've uh, read in the media, uh, people asking is, will the conventions in the, of US parties in the future ever be, uh, you know, like in the past, or will they do part of it, uh, you know, in the, via, via Zoom or via some other uh, media? Uh, but we don't know when countries will get back to constitutional schedules, when will, whether vote by mail will increase permanently. In some countries where the mail is not reliable, that's even a bigger problem. Uh, will turnout increase or decrease? Will political equality increase or decrease? And what will be the level of external in, of the involvement of external actors? I found this picture recently very, I mean, I saw it in the news and then I found it in the, uh, in the newspaper. It's a group of African leaders, you know, from West Africa meeting via Zoom to try to solve the, or to try to discuss uh, what are they gonna do about the coup d'etat in Mali, you know, which was on August 8th. So this is the first time that I see, you know, I think hopefully there won't be too many coups d'etat, but it's a very unique thing having a group of, you know, leaders, some of them are authoritarian, but they're still discussing, you know, hey, what do we do about this coup d'etat via, via Zoom? And last but not least, no, this is last, uh, I want to talk about citizens and civil society because uh, I study citizens, I study individual, you know, people and public opinion. Democracy cannot exist without citizens. So uh, the future of, the, of democracy, in the post-pandemic world also has to do with citizens. And we wonder what will citizens' behavior be? Will democracy be a priority for many, as one of my colleagues said, or are they willing to forego democracy for economic stability? It doesn't mean that one thing has to go without the other, but in many countries, one thing is going to be together. You know, they, they are going to be together. Maybe people will see that this leader who is not too democratic is going to bring democratic, you know, economic stability, so they're going to vote for him. So we don't know whether they're going to forego democracy. Those of you, if there are any historians uh, here, uh, will know that history tells us that not all citizens choose democracy. Uh, when they have problems, uh, Nazi Germany being one of the most specific examples of when they actually elected Hitler. But also the embrace of democracy was fundamental in reconstruction after World War II, so we don't know. But in any case, democratic political culture, uh, citizens or citizens with a democratic political culture should choose democracy regardless. Uh, we don't know how citizens will react to the challenges, whether they'll be more engaged or less engaged in political processes. We don't know whether we'll trust political, political institutions more or less. Uh, we've seen that more trust equals better pandemic outcome, at least so far in the studies that have been done. But we don't know if a better outcome is going to make people trust institutions more and whether a poor outcome is going to make them trust less. And civil society, which is, uh, you know, those organizations that are not political parties that, that uh, influence, uh, that play a role, uh, also might play a role. Uh, will dialogue and negotiation emerge as an option in the midst of polarized society? Uh, we know in those of us who study political culture that tolerance is a key component of the, any democratic political culture. So will tolerance be back on the table and the ability to talk to each other and to dialogue, which uh, is not going well in many countries? Will social capital, which is a topic that one of my colleagues in political science has been studying for Kansas, uh, be a positive influence on democracy? You know, the social capital, meaning the parts of society that, uh, that even if they're not related to politics, they have an influence. And what role will social media play? Uh, I study the developing world and I know that WhatsApp is widely used in developing democracy. I belong to several chats, you know, WhatsApp chats, including one of my former uh, university friends in, in Guatemala, and uh, they uh, share sometimes on WhatsApp things that are like, you know, so out of, you know, uh, out of complete reality. And they, they just, we just share them because we're all, you know, professionals, but we just share them to show what people are showing. And, and people believe things, you know, believe things that WhatsApp is saying, and many of them are bad influences. You know, in elections, they say terrible things about other people. And Twitter, of course, is for me an oversimplification of complex issues, so we don't know what effect that's going to have in a post-pandemic world. 
So uh, that is the end of my talk. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have time to show you the websites and uh, I do encourage you to look at them if you want to look at them at the end of this talk uh, within the PowerPoint. Uh, they have interactive maps. If one of you is more interested in knowing how the U.S. is faring in this pandemic, I'm not an expert in U.S. politics, but you can go to these different sites and see what uh, what the democracy says about uh, the U.S. and what international ideas says about the impact of the pandemic in um, in the U.S. So I'll leave it here. I think I went five minutes over the limit because Cheryl told me 45, <laughs> but uh, at least I leave 10 minutes for questions. So uh, I'll, I'll share my my screen now. Great. Thank you, Denora. That was very interesting. And uh, I learned a lot from your session. So thank you very much for, for being with us today. Um, does anyone here have any questions they would like to ask Dr. Asperu? Uh, David Eichhorn has raised his hand. So I want to go back to one of your first slides and you, where you listed a number of um, different characteristics. And on the top, you had regime type. And on the bottom, you had political culture. And they're the same continuum, democratic to authoritarian. Mm -hmm. um, what is the mapping between those two types? I mean, you would assume that countries that have a democratic political culture have a democratic regime, oh, yeah. but I'm sure that's not always the case. And, and moreover, do you think that that will affect what you talked about at the very end, uh, sort of the uh, where democratic societies go in a post-pandemic um, world? Oh, very interesting question. And that taps on what I do for, for, for living, you know, for research. Uh, yeah, so every society has a combination of democratic and authoritarian citizens. So uh, we talk about pockets of authoritarianism, even if the, in democratic countries like the US, uh, some people put it at maybe 20% of the population holds authoritarian values. You know, they believe in a, in a strong man rather than in an elected leader. They believe that people shouldn't have the right to protest, that people shouldn't have the right to vote, etc. Now that uh, proportion changes in developing democracies. In some democracies uh, uh, that are new democracies, unfortunately, like many in Latin America, uh, people think that, uh, that yeah, maybe democracy is not the best system of government. Maybe other systems of governance are better. You know, there's so much corruption that they think that maybe authoritarian regimes are better, even though authoritarian regimes don't give information, and that's why we didn't know about the corruption in Latin America during the military regimes. So to answer your question, in every society, you're going to find these pockets of authoritarians, but in some societies, those are not pockets. They are actually a, a large number. And in societies like Russia, uh, actually, there is a large number of authoritarians, you know, people that believe that Putin is their rightful leader and that they like him because he's a strongman that defends the country, right, from other things. And the vote for populism in many countries has been linked in, even in Western Europe, to precisely these uh, pockets of authoritarian citizens that have a culture, you know, that, that they believe that uh, free expression and uh, free protest and everything is an annoyance and that it'd be better if uh, limit uh, restrictions uh, are exerted on people. Now, whether this will affect after the pandemic, it, it, like I said, I think it's an open question right now. I think countries that have a strong democracy, a democratic culture, you know, a strong, like where the majority of the population has a democratic culture, are going to be uh, doing a better job getting back to normal democracy or to enhance democracy. And countries that have large segments of the population with authoritarian values, uh, they're going to have a harder time getting back to normal. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Dr. Aspiru? Uh, Dr. Andrew Hipsley has a question. Thank you for that wonderful talk. I've learned so much, Nora. It's, it's been wonderful to hear it. Um, one of the things you said, and I can't remember what kind of regime it was exactly, but you said uh, what's difficult uh, in when we go when we go and try and add up all the numbers is discovering how well the authoritarian regime did compared to the, the democratic one in terms of actually um, doing something and combating the virus because they may not declare their numbers. 
um, whereas you'd think that the democratic one would be more transparent. But um, in some ways, it may be in their interest to declare their numbers or even over-exaggerate their numbers so that they can take these an very anti-democratic measures that you also talked about. So mm -hmm. as, have you thought about that tension between hiding the truth on the one hand um, to say, look, we're, we're a very good um, government for you, and divulging the truth or even exaggerating it to say, look, we need to take these undemocratic measures just for the moment, like Turkey did, for example, or Hungary. Okay. That, that is a very interesting question. Uh, no, thank you for that. Um, and it really depends on the context, context of each country. Um, for instance, if a country has an electoral authoritarian regime and the regime wants to be re-elected, you know, and the, the government wants to be re-elected, they might take issue with, hey, the pandemic really didn't hit us that hard, you know, and I was able to contain it and I was able to, to do things, you know, especially a strong men would take that position. Um, also, they want to minimize it because of the economy, right? Uh, because there is an economic hit uh, in every society, you know, in, in the world, there is an economic fit from the pandemic. And uh, being able to reopen is going to be, uh, to make it easier to, to go back to normal, right? Uh, to a certain extent. Uh, I don't think authoritarian regimes are too worried in general about imposing restrictions. Citizens cannot complain anyways, right? I mean, they don't have the right to complain. Uh, in Hungary, Actually, Orban, like Bukele in El Salvador, he has high levels of approval. He won the elections last year overwhelmingly. So uh, there we see a couple of countries in which you see, you know, pockets of citizens who really are giving priority to other things, not necessarily to having a democratic leader in power. So uh, it might be to their advantage. I'm trying to think in what cases, but I think mostly it's to the disadvantage to show harsh numbers. Democratic countries might be different, right? We want to show that things are not well in reality because we do want people to continue you know, doing, um, make, taking measures, wearing masks and other things. But in the authoritarian countries, people have to do it anyways. You know, they have to wear a mask or they are going to get in jail, right? Or they'll be taken to jail. The media cannot criticize it you know, criticize or they're going to be, you know, killed or put in jail or something. So it is an important tension, but I think it depends on every country. Okay, great. We have a question from Nathan Filbert with the libraries. And the question is, I'm curious about the open questions regarding prognosis slash possibilities towards the future of forms of governance slash political relationships, etc. Do you have ideas about how those questions we are able to observe in scenarios like COVID new ways of addressing these? Or do we wait and observe and analyze? Oh, very interesting question. Um, I think that uh, the dynamic in every country is going to determine where things are going to be going. In the past, for instance, uh, Western democracies had a lot of influence on developing democracies and not influence in the bad way, but actually there is, I studied a lot of democracy aid, you know, provided the assistance to democracy and even pressure from, well, for instance, China has been undergoing a lot of pressure from the US and other countries because of the restrictive uh, national security law. But uh, so, but external actors now are really worried about their own, you know, what's going on within their own countries. So we have seen, and this has been documented, uh, kind of a retraction of a lot of Western uh, countries, uh, trying to, to punish you know, authoritarian regimes or semi-authoritarian regimes or, or leaders that have been taking measures that are out of, uh, out of a democratic framework. Uh, for instance, Bukele in El Salvador hasn't suffered much of a consequence because of, he's been restricting liberties. Uh, the US hasn't said much, you know, and other countries haven't said, Euro, the European Union you know, did say, you know, this is not right, but they, uh, because of the pandemic, Europeans are more focused on other things as well as the U.S. So I think that overall we don't know, you know, and it's going to depend on the, on the dynamic of each country. Okay, I just wanted to um, let you all know that we are continuing the series for the next four weeks. Um, Chase Billingham, who's an assistant professor of sociology at Wichita State, will be our guest next week at 4 p.m. He'll be a talk, his talk will be rethinking the city and the community for a post-pandemic world. So that, that sounds like it'll be another really interesting 
uh, session on how the pandemic has influenced all aspects of life. So Dr. Asperu, thank you very much for joining us. She did a great job and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you everyone for, for joining in and for listening to me. Thank you for the invitation, Andrew. Bye everyone. <laughs>